When I walk around my neighborhood, one of the things that fascinates me the most are trees. Their imposing presence, their architecture, the ramification of their branches. In the state of Penn's woods, it's not difficult to find impressive ones, but I'm sure in many other places you can relate to this experience. How long have they been there? I often wander in front of oaks, maples, or pine trees. 40, 60, a hundred years for some, because what a tree does is display the passing of time. When were they planted? I then imagined their spot, when perhaps there was nothing more than a little shoot no one paid any attention to, or just the hidden energy of a seed, which would later expand into a fascinating structure, because a tree always implies a beginning. Trees are a good metaphor for our life, hidden in the secret of a tiny embryo and growing in many ramifications, and for our universe too, which bursts forth from an unseen explosion of energy at the origin of our time and is still expanding. The desire to know the energy that moves everything into being is the burning drive of our humanity, and for this reason, science, philosophy, the arts, and the religions have always sought our beginnings and destination as the object of their investigation. As Aquinas said in a famous commentary on Aristotle's law of inertia, everything that moves implies something that moves it. Quid quid movetur ab alio movetur. So what is the first mover? Philosophers, artists, and theologians have identified it from time to time as a rational, creative, or divine spirit. And scientists as well have wondered about the necessity of a triggering mechanism that set everything in motion. In 1964, the physicist Peter Higgs and five other scientists actually postulated the existence of an elementary particle appearing a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang which allowed electrons and quarks to acquire mass and form matter as we know it. This particle, later nicknamed the God particle, is still known today as the Higgs boson. Its sensational discovery was announced to the world on July 4, 2012, by the Italian physicist Fabiola Gianotti, leader of the Atlas collaboration, which reproduced it through the Large Hadron Collider. Gianotti would later go on to become the general director of the CERN in Geneva. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CERN, from the French words for Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire, the European Organization for Nuclear Research is one of the world's largest and most respected centers of collaborative scientific research on fundamental physics. It comprises over 12,000 scientists of 110 nationalities from institutes in more than 70 countries. CERN is also the center where Tim Berners-Lee launched his information management proposal in 1989, what we know as the World Wide Web. The Large Hadron Collider, a 27-kilometer tunnel running beneath France and Switzerland, is the world's highest energy particle accelerator and the largest machine in the world. Now, not only is Fabiola Gianotti the first woman to be appointed director general of CERN, but she is also the first scientist ever to be elected for a second term. Now, if you visit the website of CERN, two questions will immediately come to the fore right from the homepage. What is the nature of our universe? What is it made of? These questions, which are inseparable from our humanity, are the real core of the philosophical, aesthetic, and scientific research of Fabiola Gianotti, today's innovator. In this episode, I won't go into the scientific details of her work. Others can do it much better than me. But instead, I'll explore the innovative model that her personality embodies of intimate connection between science and the humanities. Following her story, we'll talk about aesthetic creativity as a key tool of scientific research. As she puts it, too often people consider science and the arts to be completely decoupled, 
compartmentalized. To me, they are not different things. They are both the highest expressions of creativity, of curiosity, of the ingenuity of humanity. Gianotti's family story is a mix of arts and science. Her father, a geologist from Piedmont, infusing her a love for nature and the world around her. Her mother, from Sicily, encouraged her in the fine arts. Her drive to learn about the evolution of things, as in geology's logic of stratification, was then parallel to her passion for the tempo of things, their creative rhythm, as expressed in her love for dance and music. Before completing her doctoral studies in physics at the University of Milan in 1989 and becoming a full-time physicist at CERN in 1996, Gianotti first worked to pursue her dream of becoming a ballerina at La Scala in Milan and then cultivated her passion for music, even completing a piano degree. The former pianist would later become project leader and spokesperson of the Atlas Collaboration in 2009, general director of CERN in 2016, and member of top international committees like the Physics Advisory Committee of Fermilab and the Scientific Advisory Board of the UN Secretary General. She would be part of prestigious academies like the Italian Accademia dei Lincei, the French Academy of Science, the US National Academy of Sciences, and Listen here, the American Philosophical Society. She would receive honorary awards like the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic or the Enrico Fermi Prize, honorary degrees from the University of, Ups of Uppsala, the McGill University, the University of Chicago, and the University of Naples or the University of Edinburgh, among others. And she would be listed in the top 10 most inspirational women by The Guardian, Forbes, and BBC. In 2012, Time magazine will recognize her as the fifth most important personality of the year. Her interviews regularly appear in the world's top newspapers, magazines, and scientific journals. I will refer in today's episode to two interviews for Repubblica and the New York Times, as well as to her 2014 honorary degree address at McGill University. Now, Giannotti clearly stated that this professional journey would not have been possible without her musical upbringing, as she explained. The rigor, the precision and the creativity that I learned from my music studies are as important as my physics studies in what I do today as a scientist. In addition to music, the other source of influence on her scientific career would come from the encounter with the work and life of Marie Curie, the first woman ever to win a Nobel Prize for her pioneering work on radioactivity. What fascinated Gianotti in Curie was the fact that research was an integral part of her home life. Curie, in fact, explains Gianotti, prepared the soup for dinner at the same time as she was changing the radioactive sample in the next room. This meant for her that science is a human journey, not something separated from our day-to-day -day life and our bodily experience. Also, this meant that science, like cooking, is not about mathematically following a recipe, but rather about experimenting, creating, always going beyond the routine. So in Gianotti's work, real life or cooking has something to do with the Higgs boson. Brahms, Bach and Schubert have something in common with particle physics. How? Let's see how this applies to her work in fundamental research. Before then, however, we need to figure out not only what this research is about, but also why its pure speculative pursuit of knowledge for its own sake matters a lot. So what is fundamental research? In particle physics, it's the study of the elementary components of the universe, of the most minuscule components of matter, so quarks and ele electrons inside an atom. Fundamental research deals with the infinitely small to gain knowledge of the infinitely big. Italians have a long tradition in this field, with CERN 
another important institution of particle physics that we mentioned earlier is the Fermi Lab in Illinois, named after Enrico Fermi, the Italian professor of physics at the University of Chicago, also involved in the Manhattan Project, who initiated the Italian Institute for Nuclear Physics, Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare. Now, why does research on elementary particles matter? How does it impact our life? Where does this knowledge find applications? In Gianotti's understanding, this research responds to the primary human need to know, is indispensable to progress, and as stated in, in the founding act of CERN, is fundamental to develop technologies that can improve mankind and create its shared patrimony. Okay, good, you might say, but the question remains, what's the point of speculative theory? Or if you think about the arts, philosophy and criticism, what's the purpose of this seemingly useless knowledge? Why do we care about it, whether in science or in the arts? Here is where Gianotti's profile as a scientist and artist provides a unique contribution. Well, on the one hand, Gianotti explains that quantum mechanics and the relativity theory were received at their times as pointless speculation with no actual applications. We know now that Heisenberg and Planck are behind the development of electronics, and that Einstein's relativity is fundamental to GPS technologies. On the other hand, she indicates that the pursuit of knowledge for no other purpose than knowledge itself is actually what gives us worth as humans. Not only because this knowledge represents an antidote to any instrumentalization, but also because science and the arts realize in her words the highest expressions of human beings that distinguish us from animals. What is the application of Mozart's sonata? None, she says, but we, not, we could not live without music. In her pursuit of this knowledge, Gianotti indicates three key attitudes to sustain the scientific and philosophical passion to find out how things work or where they came from. Determination, modesty, and imagination. Determination is a stubborn perseverance in not giving up on one's dream and in cherishing the truth of an object above everything. Gianotti warns us that knowledge is an endless journey that even though someone can deprive us of our job, our salary, our house, no one can take away our brain. Modesty is the sense of our ignorance, which leads to both humility and the audacity of asking. In looking at the starry sky, we are reminded that we see only 5% of what's out there. The rest we don't know, so we call it dark energy or dark matter. Despite our lack of knowledge, we are nevertheless endowed with an endless capacity to ask. Science and the arts are the privileged places that force us to ask questions, something that we often bypass. Imagination is the ability to connect different elements or ingredients in a new synthesis, like in cooking. It is a platform for cultivating our curiosity and our unquenchable thirst for beauty. And there is nothing that moves us to think of what we are made of or what we are made for, like the experience of beauty. But what is beauty? What is beauty for? In an interview for Repubblica, Giamatti explained that in the realm of physics, beauty coincides with an imperfect symmetry. We could rephrase, Beauty is a stumbling block in our lives, which prevents us from resting on what we already know or possess. It's a primary mover that leaves us ever restless. It's a promise of fullness, pleasure, and even happiness that awakens us to leave our comfort behind and follow a path of knowledge. Literary scholars call narrative pact the implicit promise that a writer makes to a reader at the beginning of a book that by continuing to read, he or she will find an even greater fulfillment or joy 
This idea of the narrative path is key to understanding why we want to keep exploring when the answer to our questions is not even in sight. Some of the CERN's projects develop over the span of 50 or 70 years. And actually, the Higgs boson discovery shed by the slight ray of light on the study of dark matter. So what difference does beauty make? What is it for? To nurture this pact with our humanity that is implicit in our urge to know. To keep us alive, because the real work is to keep oneself burning, moving, searching, without surrendering to cheap answers or being swallowed by the mediocrity of compromise. Scientific research and artistic creativity then serve the ultimate purpose of producing knowledge that moves, that can keep our flame burning, our life worthwhile, and our hearts warm in pursuing happiness. Without this horizon, without this taste, all our knowledge, even the so-called useful stuff, will inevitably fall into manipulation, immobility, or even sadness. Without the horizon of this aesthetic awe, moral philosophy, and even of religious wonder, there is no science. Whether we believe or not, the experience of beauty for everyone is a fundamental tool to keep our questions open to possibility and not to settle for pre-made assumptions. This is the same reflection that Gianotti proposed on the issue of science and religion in relation to the Higgs boson or particle of God. And here he is. There is no unique answer, she points out. There are people who say, oh, what I observe brings me to something beyond what I see. And there are people who say, what I observe is what I believe, and I stop here. It's enough to say that physics cannot demonstrate the existence or not of God. The question about God, about the origins of the universe, about the destination of our human journey remains open. The encounter with great figures like Fabiola Gianotti is a great source of encouragement to pursue the path of knowledge and not to give up on our deepest questions, which are the most precious drive for innovation and progress. Perhaps after this chat, you will start to look at trees or perhaps the sky that moves above us in a slightly different way. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Italian Innovators YouTube channel or visit the webpage www.italianinnovators.com uh, to receive notification of new episodes and get a sense of the broader project of Italian Innovators. Uh, you can also follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter for additional materials about the show. Thank you again. Arrivederci e alla prossima.